more advanced topics for RNNs. So the first thing you might want to think of is, well, you know, can I use some of the tricks that I know of from before for, you know, maybe convnets? Can I use them also here? And well, so remember, in res in ResNets, right? So residual networks, we try to address the issue that, well, if I add layers, well, does it actually get more accurate? And one of the nice things would be if, as I add more layers, my function class becomes richer, and it contains the original function class as a subset. Right? Because if it's just you know, larger but different, then it may be larger and different, and, well, too different, so I can't really use it very much. So that's not so good. And the key idea in here at all from 2015 was to say, well, let's just short circuit the entire nonlinearity and add the input directly to the output. Okay. That was a very simple idea because in this case, you know, in the simplest case, the entire network just lets the input through. So the simplest function is the one that is just, you know, the identity rather than the constant function zero. And if you look at the HMM, well, you can basically do exactly the same idea. So this is our deep RNN, and in this case, the simplest function would be one that lets absolutely nothing through. So that doesn't work very well, but, ta-da, you can add residual connections. And so you would, for instance, you know, go and you know, add the, output, the, the input to a layer to its output, and then every once in a while you aggregate, and then you do this again. And so these are then you know, ResNets with residual connections. There are different flavors of this, but yeah, this is the basic idea. So, well, can we do more? Well, you know, because after all, after ResNets, there was this paper about dense nets. And again, drum roll, please. You can do dense nets with, you know, RNNs as well. You just add a lot more connections and it, the hidden states become really big. So every once in a while, you really want to have a transli transition layer that squishes everything, right? But as a rule of thumb, residual connections are usually good for everything. Dense net connections, yeah, not so much. And this is, again, a slight typo here. What it should be. Actually, can somebody tell me what it should be? Which symbol do I need to add here? Okay, which symbol do I need to add? Who thinks it's a multiplication? Who thinks it's an addition? Okay, addition would give me a ResNet. Okay, who thinks it's subtraction? Nobody, good. It's this one here, comma. You just concatenate. And in concatenating things, I get a more complex, you know, larger state. And since this keeps on growing larger and getting larger and larger, every once in a while I need to squish it by, you know, maybe multiplying it by some matrix and then having some nonlinearity. And then again I let it grow. That works okay, but stick to the resnets. Okay. So then that was the question about regularization. So what can we do? And so, you know, RNNs just overfit like any other model, and then, you know, the sequential dependence is really the, you know, the hard thing to control. So for instance, you know, capacity in terms of depth, as you go from one layer to the next, you can use dropout maybe, or, you know, some weight decay or something. 
But the sequential part is really the messy part because you know one variable depends on the other. And so if you're not careful there, you end up introducing spurious dependency or completely shredding the dependency. Right. So basically people tried this. Um, and you know that's about as hand wavy an explanation that they came up with. Bottom line, if you use dropout for temporal connections, it does not work. So, but dropout, remember, it basically just throws out a couple of edges in your dependency graph, and that's it. So then people, so this is, there's some elaborate Bayesian reasoning around it, but you can forget about that because all you care about is here the practical part rather than you know using you know different dropout variables you know per time slice you use the same mask across all time windows at least within the mini batch and so you essentially have a dropout mask for you know the sequential dependency and a dropout mask you know for the dependency you know as you move from one layer to another and you optimize for that and then you take another mini batch and you get another dropout mask and so you can with a lot of hand waving, argue that this is somehow related to Bayesian statistics, and that's why it's called variational dropout. But for all intents and purposes, it's a very nice heuristic that actually works. So it's dropout with the same mask throughout the sequence. Okay, use that. Um, so then, can I do other things? Well, let's zone out. So zone out happens when you're maybe really tired, you come to the lecture and then you zone out for a minute and then you wake up again and go like, well, what the heck did Alex say? And well, what this does is it forces you to come up with a slightly more advanced model of what I'm talking about, which doesn't depend on every single individual word, but tries to capture more overall what my intention is that I'm trying to convey to you. So if you zone out occasionally, but not too often, your model of my class might improve. Okay. Well, at least that's the hope, right? So what does it actually mean? It means that every once in a while, I don't update my hidden state. So remember when we looked at the update functions in a GRU or LSTM, we had this explicit variable which basically controlled whether the state gets updated or not. And all this does is it just really forces that state not to update, so we just tamper with that update variable. If I have a regular RNN, then I, well, I just set the states the same, but in the other case, at least it has some interpretation of, well, doing dropout in some very strange way. But again, people tried this, it works. Um, any questions so far? And then, there's one more. So there's parameter averaging, and there's this paper by Meriti et al. from 2017, which, well, you could have probably, they could have called it how to train your RNN, right? Parts 1 to 10. Um, and it's, a treasure trove of a lot of tricks that they tried and you know showing how those various tricks improve things. And so I've covered some of the more important ones but then there are minor tricks in every one of those gives you a tiny little boost. Um, the unfortunate thing is these are not necessarily well understood despite various claims of them being well understood. With well understood I mean a theorem and no. Now, one of the key parts is this parameter averaging. So what they do is basically they, they train the LSTM, and at some point they just start averaging the parameters over different runs. Now that looks and sounds really, really weird, right? So let me explain why this is weird and why they do it nonetheless. Let's take a convex function. Okay. 
And I want to minimize that convex function, so I want to get here. And let's say I'm there. Maybe I'm there, and I'm here, and there. Right. So, you know, the, on average, if I look at the function values here, here, and here, well, you know, I can maybe assume that, you know, this will be kind of okay, right? So, you know, I have some, you know, one over n sum over i going from 1 to n f of x i, right? Let's just take two values, right? Now, if I have a convex function, I know that the function values are always below that convex combination. So in other words, this is greater or equal than sum over i going from 1 to n, 1 over n. Uh, well, sorry, this has to be an f xi. Actually, this would work for arbitrary weighting coefficients, but yeah. So this is Jensen's inequality. So if I therefore, you know, was optimizing, you know, over values, well, you know, parameter averaging may actually not be such a terrible idea. Unfortunately, in a deep network, that's not what reality looks like. Reality may very well look like this. So this may very well be, you know, local maximum or local minimum. So it doesn't actually guarantee me even that things get better, right? So if I were to average over those two points here, I might end up being there, and that's actually worse than where I started from. So parameter averaging looks like a really stupid idea. Turns out, though, it works well in practice. There are two papers that kind of independently discovered that. There's the you know, how to train your RNN. And then there's a paper by Andrew Wilson and his team on stochastic weight averaging, which experimentally showed that this works more generally. The reason why they, at least in that second paper, argued that it works is because it turns out that at least locally in near convergence, the problem looks kind of convexish, at least in a subspace that matters. Okay. Now, then there's this thing called fraternal dropout, where you basically run dropout on, you know, with two different dropout masks, and you want to make sure that, you know, the outputs remain reasonably resilient to the different dropout masks. So you can do that. And there are probably 50 other versions. They all kind of help. The, I mean, what you see is that they're all geared towards minimizing the variation that you get by changing your parameters. Okay. So, any questions so far? Yep. Yes. So the parameter, the stochastic weight averaging, is something that, uh, for instance, they actually first tried on CNNs, and it worked very well. And then they applied it to RNNs. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. 